Since 1895, relations between the Russian Empire and Japanese Empire had been on a steady course of deterioration until it reached a climax in 1904 with the outbreak of war between the two empires. The Qing Dynasty leased what became known as Port Arthur to Russia in 1897, which ended up being an important maritime trade port. Of course, Russia also had lines running through Manchuria connecting to Port Arthur in order to keep a steady flow of supplies between the Pacific and mainland Russia. With the Japanese intending to expand its sphere of influence into Manchuria, the Russians having the supply lines in Port Arthur proved to be an issue, and the Japanese attempted negotiations with the Russians in order to get a better grasp on this location. However, the Russians would not budge rightfully so, and the Japanese would not accept no for an answer, so, in February of 1904, they decided to go to war. This would prove difficult for the Japanese, since the Russians had a strong presence of warships at Port Arthur. This included the battleships Petropavlovsk, Sevastopol, Perezvet, Pobeda, Poltava, Serezvish, and Retsvizan. As for the Japanese, they actually had an equivalent number of battleships to toss into the battle. These were the Mikasa, Asahi, Hatsuse, Shikishima, Yashimo, and Fuji. On the 6th of February 1904, the Japanese fleet under the command of Admiral Togo departed Japan, and two days later they were positioned outside of Port Arthur. In order to give themselves an immediate edge, the Japanese planned to bombard Port Arthur and launch a torpedo attack on the Russian fleet in order to quickly disable it before war was declared. On the opposite side, the Russians had orders to not initiate any form of an attack against the Japanese in order to prevent hostilities from breaking out while war was not declared. And on the very night the Japanese chose to attack, Admiral Stark was hosting a party for his wife's birthday, which incorporated many of the Russian officers. Admiral Togo dispatched ten destroyers to torpedo vessels in the Russian fleet at Port Arthur, and at 22.30, a couple of Russian destroyers made contact with the Japanese, but obeying orders to not engage in hostilities, turned away and began to report the sighting. In return, the Japanese destroyers became confused, with two colliding with one another, and few others falling out of formation, resulting in their arrival at Port Arthur being late. Half an hour past midnight on the 9th of February, the first four Japanese destroyers arrived in Port Arthur and began making their torpedo runs. Out of 16 torpedoes launched by the Japanese, only three would make contact, and all three hit separate ships. The protected cruiser Paletta was struck in its forward boiler room, caught fire, and sank in shallow waters. The battleship Retvizan was struck on the port bow, causing an 11 degree list to port, though counterflooding reduced this to 5 degrees, and with the increased draft at the bow, the ship ran aground and would not be recovered until March. The third and final torpedo struck the battleship Sesvarish on the port stern, resulting in an 18 degree list to port that was slightly reduced through counter flooding. The ship got underway and grounded at the harbor entrance, which resulted in the ship not being recovered for roughly a month. As for the rest of the Japanese torpedoes, they either missed their targets completely or were tangled up in torpedo nets since the Russian ships did have their nets deployed. Overall, the surprise element of the attack was a success, as the Russian fleet was not expecting the Japanese to engage them. However, taking advantage of the surprise attack had proven a failure, as very little damage had been done to the Russian fleet. By 8 o'clock, Admiral Togo had decided to send a reconnaissance group of four cruisers to Port Arthur under the command of Vice Admiral Diwa to investigate the damage the Japanese destroyers had caused in the early hours of the morning. Vice Admiral Dewa's reconnaissance proved to be a difficult task, as upon arriving at the harbor, there was a hefty fog surrounding it. He closed within 7,500 yards of the Russian fleet, noticed that roughly five Russian ships were listing, while the rest appeared to be inactive, and the Russians did not attempt engaging the four Japanese cruisers. And so, Dewa drew the conclusion that the Russian fleet was out of action. He returned to Togo and urged the Japanese fleet immediately strike the Russians while they were at their weakest position, and Admiral Togo agreed, completely ignoring the threat of the shore batteries since the Russian fleet appeared to be out of action, meaning the Japanese had the full advantage. But what the Japanese didn't realize is that the Russians were actually preparing their warships for a naval battle. 
Togo was cautious about going on the offensive towards Port Arthur, as he would have preferred to draw the Russian fleet out of the harbor to get it away from the shore batteries, and so the 1st and 2nd Divisions would attack, while the 3rd would sit back in reserve. As the Javanese approached Port Arthur, they would encounter the protected cruiser Boyarin, which was placed on patrol and spotting duties for the Russian fleet, who would fire a shot towards the battleship Mikasa, then turn and run towards the main Russian body. The Japanese pressed on, and by noon, they were five miles outside of Port Arthur, and Admiral Togo ordered his ships to open fire. The main battery guns of his battleships would focus on the shore batteries, while the smaller secondary armament and the main armament of his cruisers in Division 2 would focus on the Russian fleet, which was supposed to be disabled. To the surprise of Admiral Togo, the Russian ships started to move and began returning fire, supported by the shore batteries, and within the opening five minutes, Mikasa was struck by a shell overhead of the after bridge, killing six of its crew. Togo immediately recognized the critical error that his reconnaissance cruisers had made earlier that morning, but for now he decided to hold the battle line. At 12.20, just 20 minutes after opening fire, Togo realized the dire position his ships was in, and so he decided to reverse course and engage the Russians at a different time and at a different location. Shooting between both sides had proven very poor. As a result, the Japanese battleship line had only taken a total of seven hits, spread amongst the Shikishima, Mikasa, Fuji, and Hatsuze, while in return, the Russian battleships only received five hits, spread between the Petropavlovsk, Pobeda, Botava, and Zvezdopol. The protected cruiser Novik was one of the few Russian ships to keep up the chase on the Japanese fleet, and it managed to close within 3,000 yards and launch a torpedo at the Japanese, though no hit was obtained. In return, the Japanese struck Novik below the waterline and caused flooding. Novik broke off the chase and returned to Port Arthur, where it would take more than a week to patch up the hole. The Battle of Port Arthur proved to be inconclusive, which was far from the resounding victory the Japanese had initially sought to obtain. Ninety Japanese sailors were killed, compared to 150 Russian sailors, and neither side had a ship permanently knocked out of action. The Russian ships that had been destroyed and sunk in the torpedo attack would all be recovered and repaired to see action in the future. Three hours after the Battle of Port Arthur, Japan's official declaration of war arrived in the hands of Russian diplomats, and eight days later, the Russians would declare war on the Japanese. On the 11th of February, to prevent the Japanese fleet from freely sailing into Port Arthur again, the Russians sent the mine layer Yenisei to lay a minefield in hopes of striking down one of the Japanese ships. While laying the mines, one mine broke free from its chain and started to float towards Yenisei. Yenisei turned and accidentally swung its rudder into another mine, resulting in the mine detonating, and then the mines that were still on board Yenisei detonated as well. The protected cruiser Boerin witnessed the event and attempted to come to the NSA's assistance, but in turn struck one of the mines and had to be abandoned. Two Russian ships were sunk by their own minefield, and on top of that, the only chart showing the position of the mines went to the bottom of the ocean with the Yenisei. This layer of protection for Port Arthur ended up becoming a nightmare for the Russians. By the 24th of February, the Japanese started sinking hulks of shipping outside of Port Arthur in an attempt to blockade the Russian ships within the harbor. And on that same day, the Russians swapped the commanders of the Russian fleet at Port Arthur. Command would now go to Admiral Makarov. Makarov would not arrive until the 8th of March, and he would raise his flag aboard the battleship Petropavlovsk, and Makarov was a great inspiration to the Russian sailors, and also a sturdy commander, so he began shaping up his fleet to challenge the Japanese equally. He was effectively the Russian version of Admiral Togo. While Admiral Makarov was on his way to Port Arthur, the Japanese and Russian fleets would engage each other a couple of times with virtually no results coming out of any of the engagements. When Makarov arrived, he began straightening out the Russian sailors and forming his ships into a proper battle fleet. He had heavily reformed the way that the Pacific Squadron was operated. On the 12th of April, the Japanese would lay a minefield, and the next day they would attempt to lure out a portion of the Russian fleet, and they proved successful. 
This included the flagship Petropavlovsk, with Admiral Makarov on board. When Makarov spotted that he was sailing into five Japanese battleships, he reversed his course and went straight into the Japanese minefield. Petropavlovsk would unknowingly strike two or three Japanese mines, and this would result in the ship's magazines detonating, killing Admiral Makarov and sending Petropavlovsk to the bottom. The ship vanished within two minutes, taking with it more than 600 sailors. Togo learned that his equivalent adversary had been killed in the sinking, and on the 14th of April, the Japanese would fly flags at half-mast to honor their fallen adversary. But with Makarov's death, the Japanese were going to take the advantage, and Togo began long-range bombardments of Port Arthur, and this prompted the Russians to lay even more minefields. This attempt at laying a minefield would prove far more successful than the first one, as while the Japanese were operating outside of Port Arthur, the battleship Hatsuse struck one of the mines. The battleship Yashima attempted to close and assist Hatsuse, and ended up striking two mines. Then, Hatsuse struck another mine. Given the course of the day, both battleships would succumb to their damage. Roughly 500 Japanese sailors were killed between the two battleships sinking. Small operations between the two fleets would continue until the 10th of August, 1904, when the Battle of Yellow Sea would occur. But that is a story for another day. So, with that having been said, hopefully you have learned something new in today's video. If so, why not leave a like and a comment down below, and have a wonderful day.